Good evening, everyone. Welcome. I'm Mary Grant, and I'm the president of the Edward M. Kennedy Institute for the United States Senate, and it is a true pleasure to welcome all of you here this evening. Thank you for being here as we begin a new segment of our Getting to the Point series, conversations with presidential candidates from both sides of the aisle. As voters here in the Commonwealth and across the nation prepare to cast ballots in the 2020 election, the Institute is pleased to provide a venue for candidate conversations. It is essential that we have an opportunity to hear from contenders, no matter what state we vote in or when that primary may be held. Thomas Jefferson once said that an informed citizenry is at the heart of a dynamic democracy. That could not be more accurate for the upcoming elections cycle. Tonight, the Institute is honored to welcome former Massachusetts Governor Bill Weld, who is seeking the Republican nomination for President of the United States. Governor Weld served as Chief Executive Officer of the Commonwealth for two terms beginning in 1991. Prior to being elected, Governor Weld served seven years in President Ronald Reagan's Ju Justice Department as Assistant U.S. Attorney General in charge of the Criminal Division in Washington, D.C., and as the United States Attorney for Massachusetts. Governor, thank you for being here to share your vision and policy views on the issues facing the country. As the primaries heat up, there may be increased tension among the political parties or even divisions within. Be that as it may, in the midst of competition, we at the Institute believe that there remains the opportunity and indeed the need for civil discourse and the pursuit of common ground, something that the man for whom the Institute is named was a master at. To moderate tonight's conversation, we are delighted to welcome back to the Institute, Allison King. Allison is an award-winning political reporter with NBC Boston and New England Cable News. She has been at those stations for over two decades and has covered many campaigns, including six presidential races, with some of the location coverage on site in New Hampshire. Allison, it is always great to have you at the Institute. Next, and before the conversation begins, I would like to invite you to please join me in welcoming Governor Weld to the podium to provide some opening comments. Governor Weld, welcome. Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much, Dr. Grant, and thanks to all of you for coming tonight, and thank you, above all, to the Edward M. Kennedy Institute for hosting us. I'm Bill Weld, and I'm running for president. Whoa! I want to talk to you tonight about why I am running, and I have a lot of specific ideas on all sorts of fronts that I hope we'll talk about in our moderated uh, discussion with Alison King. But first, I do want to say a few words about what I believe is an urgent matter for us all, the current crisis of trust in America. I believe we've reached a critical tipping point in the history of our country, a time when we must take action to preserve and safeguard the freedoms and thriving prosperity that this country's citizens have enjoyed for the last 240 years. In the two and a half years since he was sworn in as president, Donald Trump has slammed like a one-man wrecking ball against the constitutional foundations of the democracy that our founding fathers, with great insight and on the basis of vast experience, so painstakingly built. He has hollowed out the departments of state, defense, homeland, and national security, leaving us perilously unprepared for crises of all kinds. This vacuum of power, of course, devolves power back to his hands personally, which is exactly what he wants. He has run roughshod over the rule of law, refusing to recognize to any degree the constitutionally prescribed separation of powers, and I regret to say this, he lies daily to the American people. He has sidled up coyly to brutal dictators and autocrats, alienated our international allies, and made it a point to spread feelings of fear, anger, and even hate between different groups of American citizens. He consistently places his own interests 
above those of the country. More than anything else, Donald Trump has broken the bond of trust and goodwill that the American people have traditionally felt for our government and the people running it. Over time, as feelings of distrust and disapproval have expanded, we've seen the rise of grassroots movements led by angry and dissatisfied citizens. While they may disagree on a great many issues, at their core, these different movements are nothing more than simply American citizens who feel betrayed by a government that has failed and abandoned them. In truth, there are hundreds of examples of government failing the people and elected officials betraying the public trust. I know because I prosecuted more than 100 of them. In my experience, however, the great majority of people who seek to serve the public are decent, honorable people who want to do the right thing for the right reasons when they start. Perhaps the biggest saboteur of real accomplishment for all members of Congress is that they exist in a state of constant campaigning. A perpetual focus on the re-election process forces too many politicians to spend an inordinate amount of time fundraising and making promises and not nearly enough time solving problems and fulfilling the promises they have made. Our congressmen and women spend hours a day busily cold calling potential donors like telemarketers, then rush off to vote on legislation they haven't even read. There is, however, a simple solution that we know from decades of polling the overwhelming majority of Americans support, congressional term limits. I've supported term limits since the beginning of my time in public service. When I was in office as governor, I was the national co-chair of U.S. term limits. As president, I will immediately ask Congress to initiate the constitutional process to advance term limits, three terms for the House and two terms for the Senate. By purging Congress of career politicians and restoring the founders' ideal of citizen legislators, we will refocus our government on the common good. We would also, incidentally, be doing any would-be career politicians a big favor. Life is large, and they should be given a chance to explore its many offerings. <laughs> Not sure they'd appreciate that up front, but that's the fact. Tribalism is another evil that is eroding Americans' trust. Republicans and Democrats in Washington truly appear to be embraced in a death spiral of hate and anger so intense that it can credibly serve no purpose other than to destroy the other party. Anger, when unaddressed, intensifies to rage, which fuels greater hatred and harsher insults. And as the chaos emanated from Washington washes over the people, formerly legitimate expressions of protest often escalate into ugly spectacles of pandemonium. Our constitutionally protected right to freedom of speech, which guarantees a voice to the disfranchised, has always made our nation stronger. But over the past two years, the tone of free expression has too often turned hateful, and public protests have become heartbreakingly violent. A growing culture of insult, chaos, and ever-escalating rage leads inextricably to violence this is exactly how tyrannies are born. Such political perversions may work brilliantly within a Game of Thrones episode, but, but they should never be acceptable in the United States of America. We must mend the torn fabric of our American democracy. We must forgive past injuries and forge a new American alliance of conservatives and liberals Republicans, Democrats, and independents, men and women of every color from every walk of life, an alliance that celebrates our diversity, respects our differences, and focuses on addressing head-on the challenges we face today. As president, I will appoint a bipartisan cabinet of leaders and advisors. 
Party affiliation will be an optional point on a resume, not a requirement for those who serve in my administration. As president, I will work for the common good of all Americans, always placing country above party and above self. One notable dereliction of duty coming from those in Washington, D.C., is the outrageous and ever-growing national debt. No party or recent president is immune from responsibility for this debt, but this president is already to blame for nearly $3 trillion in additional debt, and his current proposals will grow our national debt to a staggering $30 trillion in the years ahead. His tax cuts were a nod in a beneficial direction, but they did not benefit enough Americans. And worst of all, his tax cuts were not accompanied by spending cuts. This is not just fiscally irresponsible. It leaves an immoral burden on our children and our grandchildren. The fiscally feckless policies of this president will create insurmountable obstacles to opportunity and prosperity for generations to come. We cannot, I repeat, cannot let this happen. As president, I will make it a top priority to reduce the national debt and balance the budget. I will never sign a tax cut that is not accompanied by commensurate spending cuts, and I will never offer or sign a budget that is not truly balanced. With the exception of Vermont, every state in the union mandates that their governor balance the state budget every year. It's not easy. There can be no sacred cows. It requires political will and collaborative efforts by all parties. But I know it can be done because for two terms as governor, I did it. Finally, we cannot truly regain the trust of the American people without full transparency and accountability. We're living under a president who has hidden from the people not only his questionable business dealings of the past, but the degree to which he and his family are profiting off his election to the highest office in the land right now. He lied directly to the people when he said he had no business dealings with Russia and continues to lie and mislead today. Contrary to longstanding tradition, he has hidden from the people the one document that would most clearly reveal just how entangled his business dealings have been with foreign entities, his tax returns. The American people have a constitutional right to know if their president profits from relationships, personal or business, with foreign adversaries. As president, I will ask Congress to send me a bill in the first 100 days that requires presidential candidates to share with the American people five years of their past tax returns and their tax filings for every year they are in office. The President of the United States of America must always be held accountable to the people. In my recent interactions with people on the campaign trail, the overwhelming feeling I get is that the American people are exhausted by this President. They feel ignored and betrayed, confronted every day by a leader who lacks civility, experience, judgment, and compassion, fewer people than ever before identify in national polls as being extremely proud to be an American. This president is a cancer on our nation. Only we, the people, can cure what ails us. I'm not running for president just to defeat Donald Trump. I'm running to restore the faith and trust of the American people and the pride that we feel to be Americans. We deserve better. Our children deserve better. I'm asking you, each one of you, to stand with me. Let us work together to make sure that every American can look forward to a future that is bright, exciting, loving, and productive. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Governor Weld. Always great to hear your perspective and point of view uh, in your wild journey of a career that you've had. <laughs> Uh, I want to thank Dr. Grant. I want to thank the amazing staff here uh, at the Edward Kennedy Institute for having me. I always love coming here. Isn't this a cool room? It's a cool room. <laughs> it's great. I've been in the original, and this really measures up. Yes. No, this is, this is great. Um, you know, Gover Governor Weld and I had an opportunity to speak. I think it was in late March. It was just before he announced uh, that he'd be running. And the governor was doing what all good candidates do. We were in a New Hampshire diner. And we, he was walking up to people that he, of course, didn't know and introducing himself. And um, I thought it was kind of funny. One of the first tables he approached um, was a cup. Oh, Governor Weld, of course, we remember you. And, you know, I thought, oh, they're going to say, like, you know, you were the fiscal conservative or you were, you know, you, you know, clamped down on crime. Or, you know, I don't know. But no, this is what they remembered. They remembered that in 1996, during a press conference on the Charles River, he dove with his clothes on into the Charles River. <laughs> that, that's, that's actually all anyone can remember. I, I, tragically, I think that will make your obituary, Governor, but um, no, it's a great story, and uh, I was there, so I can attest to the fact that it really happened. Anyway, first of all, I just want to, being in this room and where we are, you obviously knew Ted Kennedy very well and worked with him what, what are your thoughts about the late senator when you come here? I just, I loved working with Ted Kennedy, and I did so for decades. I think the thing that most stamped him in my consciousness as a truly exceptional individual was relatively early in my career, I was uh, assistant attorney general of the United States in charge of the criminal division, that is, in charge of everything bad in the United States. And, you know, some of this stuff occasionally reaches into a U.S. senator's office. So I occasionally had, uh, you know, had to go visit individual senators to tell them about some trouble or something incubus that had washed up at their door, never in an accusatory way, although the facts were bad enough, but I always was polite. Usually, the senator that I was going to see, and I always went by myself so as not to appear too threatening, uh, usually the senator who was receiving me would have between six and eight staffers, stony-faced seated in straight back chairs around the room, witnesses for the defense, if you will, uh, to make sure that I wouldn't misquote the senator or that I couldn't form any misimpression because it would be six affidavits against me. Only one senator in the United States Senate always received me alone, and it was Ted Kennedy. You know, I'm not senator. really surprised to hear that, actually. But, uh, well, thank you very much. Let's just jump right into this. Uh, you know, you, Governor, you've had a long and distinguished career. You love to fish. You love to hunt. You love the great outdoors. You have a wonderful family. Are you doing this because you really want to do this, or are you feeling like no one else is stepping up to take this role and you need to do this? Well, no, I'm, I'm doing it for exactly the reasons I just mentioned at, at the top there. Uh, I do think there's a crisis of trust uh, in, in the country. I meant everything I said about uh, the president's natural inclinations being in the autocratic uh, direction, uh, the, the uh, less, uh, more power for him and uh, less power for the constructs that are in our constitution. Uh, you know, if he says, as he does, that a free press is the enemy of the people, I mean, not even an animal farm do you hear you know, statements like that. You know, war is peace, uh, peace is war. But uh, it's, uh, it's like Never Never Land uh, in, in this president's White House. Down is up and up is down. Uh, and it's obfuscating what he's really trying to do, which is to centralize power in himself. And he's stripping away one protection after another. If he could do away with the press, my goodness, that would be, uh, be a red-letter day uh, in his world. You used to invite us into your well, office I, back in the I'm day. Well, I'm in the opposite persuasion. I always told the press that I loved them because I came up as a prosecutor, and we're both after the same thing, which, which is to tear down the temple walls that deserve to be torn down. So I've always had a good relationship uh, with the press, and, and you know, I think the president wants to build up walls around himself so that he'll be insulated, and nobody can really see what he's doing. I mean, his refusal to release his tax returns is only one example 
of his many, uh, many efforts to shroud himself in secrecy, telling his senior people, his chief of staff, his senior national security advisor, nas senior national intelligence officials, up to and including Dan Coats, the director of national intelligence, to lie, to outright lie about what he had done to obstruct and divert and close the investigation by Bob Mueller. And they, they couldn't believe it. They said, Mr. President, I can't say that. Why not? Uh, it's not true. He effectively said to them, your point? What's your point? So, you know, I, I think of uh, the president as, as a man who, uh, he has his own demons. I don't know what they are. I'm glad I don't have them. Uh, but uh, <laughs> I, I do think that he has a difficult time conforming his conduct to the requirements either of civil or criminal law or any other norms that are generally accepted in our society. So, given what you obviously feel is the outrageousness of this president, that's kind of my point, is that are you, how surprised are you that other members, these are people in Congress, in the, in the Senate, uh, men and women who I assume you admire and like and respect and call friends, that they're not um, out, similarly outraged? Well, I, I, I was asked that question in mid-February when I started, and I said, well, I don't know. You know, I'm just getting going here. <laughs> now but it's now mid, that late you've May. About it. Now I am surprised. Uh, not that other people haven't jumped in the race, because that carries certain responsibilities that may be difficult for some people to uh, take on when they're a sitting governor of a state, you know, fearing uh, correctly that the, the president would uh, wreak reprisals upon their state. But no one's even raised their hand. No one's really even said, well, you know, we agree. And, and uh, a few people have, and uh, there's a trickle now, not all public, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to ripen into a rivulet uh, before too many uh, more weeks go by, <laughs> and we'll see what happens. You know, people say, how can you possibly go against the president's 100% uh, grip on the Republican state committees in the various states? Well, uh, that's, you know, kind of bought and paid for. Those are the Trump organizations in the states, so I'm not going to get any support there. My task is to broaden the electorate, to have more millennials and Gen Xers and suburban women. Actually, they don't have to be suburban. You know? <laughs> One of the great differences between me and Mr. Trump is I've always treated women with respect. I'll leave it at that. Okay. All right, so, please. Um, Governor, you, you always, when you ran for governor, when you ran for U.S. Senate, you always had sort of a clear platform. Um, I think in 96 it was crime, welfare, and taxes. I heard it so many times, it's embedded in my brain. Um, what is your platform running for president? Allison, as I mentioned to you earlier, I woke up uh, at 6 o'clock this morning, and I wrote up uh, some platform issues where I disagree with the incumbent, and I think this describes my platform. Do you mind? Please. Donald Trump and I are two men who have nothing in common. <laughs> I'm an economic conservative. He is not. Read spending cuts, which I did in office. I was ranked the most fiscally conservative governor in the United States. I cut spending. He didn't. I'm for working with our allies. He's for insulting them. He's for encouraging despots and autocrats abroad. Not me. He's for encouraging despotism at home. No free press, no rule of law. I've devoted my entire career to the rule of law, which he openly mocks, both in governing and in his personal behavior. I've always treated women with respect. He has not. I was an early leader on gay and lesbian civil rights. He was not. He's anti-abortion. I'm pro-choice. By the way, uh, that's a free ball. You get to have your own position there. So I'm not criticizing people who aren't pro-choice. I'm just saying it's up to everybody. And we don't want to be dictated to by uh, political leadership in Washington or anywhere else. I celebrate that America has always been a melting pot. It seems he would prefer an Aryan nation. I know that sounds strong and tough, but uh, he's very interested in bloodlines and uh, it has resonance. I think the essence, essence of our democratic system is that the individual shall not be thrust into a corner. 
He seems to delight in driving individuals into corners. I'm for free trade. He's not. He loves tariffs. I don't. Okay, there you have it. <laughs> so I, I, you know, what you're saying, what you just said, sounds to me like a list of, uh, you know, differences that would play very well in a place like, for example, New Hampshire. Now, New Hampshire is, it seems to me to be a state for you that's pretty must-win-ish. And yet, the Republican Party there, I think it's something like 68 or 70 percent, are strongly in the Donald Trump camp. So tell these people, and I've heard, this, I've heard you explain this, Governor, before, so I, but I, I think people will always ask me this. What is your path to a win? Well, New Hampshire, like Massachusetts and Vermont, is a state that permits crossover voting. So there's an easy path to expanding the electorate b beyond the party f officials of the Republican Party. Uh, and uh, in Vermont, even a Democrat can take uh, a Republican ballot on primary day. In Massachusetts uh, and New Hampshire, an unaffiliated or independent voter can take uh, a Republican ballot. That's how I got elected governor in Massachusetts. If you were born then, you may, you may recall it. Uh, so uh, the, the Republican primary was a standoff among Republican voters, and the independents flocked into the Republican primary, my primary, to my favor, six to one, six to one. And so I won the primary by quite a lot. Uh, so that, that's my path. Uh, and you know I'm going to be emphasizing issues that are of interest to a broader electorate beyond the Republican state committee. For example, climate change is a big part uh, of what I think needs to be addressed uh, head on. Uh, I, I would rejoin the Paris Accords. Uh, I do believe the polar ice cap is melting. Uh, I'm familiar with the impact that one degree Celsius uh, increase would have on the degree of melt melting uh, in the polar ice cap and how soon all of our shorelines will be rearranged. I think almost no matter what we do, all those mountain glaciers around the world, which are the sole source of water for uh, 300 million people, are going to disappear unless we act uh, strenuously uh, right now. I think the energy mix of the future that we need for our grid and around the world uh, is a mix of, uh, of renewables, uh, of wind, uh, wind and solar, also hydro from Canada uh, for us, uh, and uh, uh, therm uh, thermal en uh, energy, very much misunderstood, but there are hot granites uh, under the surface of the earth, which uh, if you ran a tube of cold water down them and they came up the other blowhole as, uh, as steam, uh, could meet the electricity needs of the United States for a period of years. And they are fed by the magma, which is the inexhaustible source of, uh, of uh, uh, heat from the center of the earth. So they're not going anywhere. Matter of fact, the center of the earth, again, this is a little understood, but it's a nuclear reactor. So that heat is going to go up uh, the magma into these hot granites uh, forever. Lastly, and, and this may be somewhat controversial in this room, uh, but I think that just objectively, uh, about 25% of our base should come from nuclear power. And I'm not talking about huge nuclear plants built on a barrier reef, you know, which is what happened in Fukushima, uh, but something like what the country of France did in the 80s, where they moved all of a sudden to vest pocket nuclear plants, which ever since then have su uh, supplied 75% of their uh, electricity. And the sharpest reduction in CO2 emissions uh, ever recorded was when France uh, did that. And, and I've been to enough rural counties, like the counties up near uh, the lakes uh, nor in the northern part of New York State, where the people are crying for more nuclear plants. Please, they're a wonderful employer. They're totally safe. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think they're right. So a little bit more thinking has to go into climate change and energy than President Trump has done with his one-word slogan, hoax. So that's the sort of issue that may bring uh, voters into the Republican Party who can be persuaded that that used to be a Republican Party uh, issue. And certainly the millennials know that they're going to reap the whirlwind there, just as they know that they're going to reap the whirlwind from indiscriminate uh, 
trillion dollar deficits every year. We're not gonna pay that bill, they're gonna pay that bill. And they're never going to see Social Security. They're already suspicious that they're never going to see Social Security. And if nothing changes, they're right. So while, you know, I wasn't going to jump into this yet, but while you just are on climate change, I know um, many people in the room, and that was one of the questions here, is about the Green New Deal. And I'm wondering how you feel about it. Do you support it? And if yes, why? And if not, why? Well, the Green New Deal is fine so far as it goes. Um, and the, the sources of energy. In fact, what I just said is consistent with the Green New Deal, except that uh, Alexander o uh, Octavio Cor Cortez's first draft of the Green New Deal had nuclear in it, and it got taken out for political reasons because some of her coalition thought nuclear power is dirty because it creates nuclear waste, which can be disposed of, and then you're left with zero CO2 emissions. So I have nuclear in my package. It's not in the Green New Deal. Uh, so that's, that's energy and, and climate change, and I agree with him on that stuff. However, as you know, it goes on to matters utterly unrelated to weather, and it says, there's going to be no more oppression. No one is going to be oppressed. Okay, well, that, that's a goal, as you know from what I said up there. Individual shall not be thrust in a corner, but no oppression. And it goes on to say, everyone uh, in the United States will have a guaranteed basic annual income, and it pointedly goes on to say, even those unwilling to work. Yeah, so I'm, I'm off the bus there. I mean, I'm the person who put in a work requirement for welfare, and it was hugely popular. It became the basis for the 1996 federal law, and the welfare rolls declined by 70% the next year, proving that, you know, they didn't really need to be on welfare. They could have moved in with their sister. But, uh, and, and people would say, when I first started to float this idea, oh, no, 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 you, you, you don't, I, I, I'm, I'm already thinking about getting a job. I'm, I'm looking for work. It's just, it's so hard. And under the law that we passed, they didn't have to look for work. All they had to do was go to work because we had a job for them at the local power plant, municipal power plant, the local school, raking leaves, uh, you know, painting, the sort of stuff that we had prisoners in our prison system doing when I was governor, get them out of prison, you know, a variety of experience, save the taxpayers money, never had a security problem. But they didn't want to go to work. They wanted to not work and be paid. And that is enshrined in the Green New Deal. So that's a non-starter. So you like big chunks of it, but there's a lot of it that you have a problem with, obviously. I, I, like, I like the uh, energy and environmental stuff, uh, except that I would very much add nuclear and I don't like the other stuff. Okay, fair enough. So, uh, the budget deficit, and I bring this up because I know you fancy yourself one of the most, well, you, I bet you feel like you're, you are the most fiscally conservative candidate in the race, Democrat or Republican. So far, that's certainly true. <laughs> so, Republicans have always been the party of fiscal conservatism, deficit hawks, what happened? I think everyone in Washington has just gotten flabby about this issue. And, you know, everyone has their pet priorities that they want to pass to reward the people that gave them all those campaign contributions. So the Democrats want to increase social spending by 5% every year. The Republicans want to increase military spending by 5% every year. So they scream and are filled with rage, as I was describing earlier. And then at the end of it, after this huge catfight, they say, oh, what the heck, we'll, we'll reach across the aisle, we'll send this one to conference committee, and we'll reach a compromise, which is agreeing to raise everything 10%. That's exactly what they do. That's how it happens. So what would you do, you know, to right the ship in that regard? So I would do what we did in Massachusetts. Charlie Baker and I got together. We read this book by David Osborne called Laboratories of Democracy, which pioneered the idea of zero-based budgeting which is taking every account in the budget and starting it each year at zero, not at last year plus 5%, which is what they do in Washington. And in Washington, anything less than a 5% increase is called a cut. And I don't know why the press doesn't explode this more, but it's called a cut. It's not a cut. It's a 5% increase. So Charlie and I, maybe I shouldn't invoke his name, but he was my Secretary of Administration Finance, so we did do this together. And... Um, so we would start every account at zero, and some accounts would go way up, 
in the healthcare area, there were some preventive programs that had hugely positive health outcomes for people and were not very expensive. So we would take that account and multiply it by five because it was so effective. We were measuring the outcome of the program the previous year. But if there's some bureaucracy that, uh, you know, didn't really do anything productive and was led by someone who's the great nephew of some long dead state senator from XYZ district in this part of the state, we'd take it to zero. And that's exactly analogous to what you have to do in Washington. There are bureaus in the Bureau of Mines, the, the former Interstate Commerce Commission, which uh, you know never did anything except be in bed with the industry it was supposed to uh, regulate and was never missed. Uh, I uh, reduced the state workforce by 8,000 people my first day in office. I never got a postcard in two terms about where is this valuable state employee uh, who you know was part of that cut that you made the first day. And I remember Ed Lashman, who was the outgoing Secretary of Administration Finance, said the state is bankrupt right now. This is in the election year, uh, in the sense that it could not pay its bills as they fell due. Uh, and I thought that was very good and, uh, and truthful and honest. Uh, and I swore that's never going to happen to me. And, uh, and it didn't. But you just have to take everything one step at a time. And in Washington, there are simply assumptions. Uh, there, there are political taboos. You don't touch this, you don't touch that. I used to say that uh, my uh, lack of prior experience in the executive branch of state government uh, served me well in that I didn't know that the sacred cows in the budget uh, were sacred. And I, in fact, I didn't even know that they were cows. So that was helpful. <laughs> President Trump could have made the same claim if he'd acted, <laughs> but he didn't. Uh, so I, I, there's a lot more policy I want to talk about. I just want to jump to some um, political board question first. Um, the Mueller report. So forget about the conspiracy, uh, because the report found no conspiracy. But as a former Watergate attorney, what do you make of the obstruction of justice charges, and how do you think it compares to what Nixon did for which he was impeached? Well, President Trump, if you read uh, volume two of the Mueller report, which is not the part about Russia, it's about him obstructing justice, uh, and obstructing the investigation, trying to get Mueller dismissed, uh, trying to get the investigation limited. Uh, there are eight or 10 examples of clear-cut obstruction of justice, very clear. 750 former career federal prosecutors, 20 of them actually appointed by the Senate, so they're political, that included me. 750 Democratic and Republican prosecutors signed a letter maybe three weeks ago saying that, uh, yeah, the Mueller report on obstruction shows that the president was clearly guilty of between three or four and or eight and ten uh, acts of obstruction that went well beyond, this is me talking, anything Mr. Nixon did. Uh, and uh, so, you know, does impeachment lie against this president? In other words, could it be done without violation of the Constitution and the requirement for high crimes and misdemeanors? Absolutely. Uh, well beyond Nixon. Uh, I was happy to see that yesterday another Republican joined me, Justin Amash, who's a Republican congressman from Michigan, who said, who said uh, only that. He went to the next step, which is saying, therefore, Mr. Trump should be impeached. My jury is still out on that. And I say that not for legal reasons, as you know, only for political reasons, in that if the president could then string that out almost until the election and keep crying witch hunt, foul, hoax, that maybe he could confuse everybody so much that uh, he'd you know, have a free ride all the way to November of 2020 without having to really get serious about anything. Because clearly, or, or to you know, join issue on any issue. Because what he's saying now is, I'm not gonna play with anybody. I'm the president, I'm a Republican, they're Democrats, they're partisan, they're against me, I'm against them. Therefore, of course, I'm not gonna give them my tax returns. Well, that doesn't follow from the fact that he's a Republican and they're Democrats. So the guy, what I said earlier about not conforming his conduct to any requirement of law, I mean, he is clueless when offered uh, an account of the strictures 
imposed by either the Constitution or statute. It's like it's skewed to his whole view of reality. They don't meet. Yeah. Well, I, I want to mention now that we're going to, what we're going to do is there are people standing around the room that have yellow cards. And if anyone in the audience has a question, flag someone down and you can write your question on the card and they'll bring it up to me. We also had some other questions, which I'm going to uh, get to. I just have two quick questions I want to ask you, and then we're going to get to all audience questions. And one is, um, Robert Mueller worked for you. Um, you called him the straightest man you've ever met, I believe. Uh, do you think we will or should hear from him? Oh, yes. I mean, as I say, uh, uh, Bob Mueller was my deputy in the Justice Department, and He's the most thorough prosecutor and the straightest, most straightforward, and that means honest, uh, person I've ever met. So, of course, we should hear from him. Uh, I'd love to know whether my reading of what went on is correct. My reading is that Bill Barr, the new AG, who is Bob's uh, technical superior, said, I'm not going to let you indict the president for obstruction. I'm just going to veto it, and I outrank you. So why do you want to perform a vain act? And that's why you get this tortured language in the report. Well, um, we decided early on not to make a traditional prosecutive judgment as to whether uh, Mr. Trump was guilty of these crimes. And under the, the, the principles of federal prosecution, which is the guiding the Bible for charging decisions in the Justice Department, if a prosecutor believes that the evidence of a crime by person X is sufficient to obtain a conviction by an unbiased jury and to uh, sustain that conviction on appeal, i.e. no error of law, you should seek charges. And what those 750 prosecutors were saying is this meets that test. And that wasn't good enough for Bill Barr, the new AG, because he had sent a memo to the Justice Department and immediately to the president, one suspects, in June of 2018 saying, I, Bill Barr, don't think you can be indicted for obstruction unless you committed the underlying offense, which would be equivalent to saying that Mr. Nixon could never have been proceeded against for obstructing the Watergate investigation unless he had been in the basement of the Watergate Hotel with G. Gordon Liddy and Howard Hunt committing the break-in. It's a ridiculous idea, and there's no support for it in the case law that I can find. But since he, as the superior, had told Bob, you can't indict, Bob had to do this, uh, you know, uh, sort of uh, Rosemary Woods uh, twisted uh, depiction of we're not going to make a judgment. We wish we could have found that the president was not guilty of obstruction, but we couldn't get there. At which point the narrative ends and it begs the question, why didn't you indict? And I think the answer is because the AG told him he could not. And I think the AG is flat wrong. The, uh, the 2008 opinion of the Office of Legal Counsel that he relies on uh, does not have the force of law. The Assistant Attorney General in charge of that division is the personal lawyer for the Attorney General and the President of the United States. In other words, that person has the job description that Bill Barr has assumed for himself, namely personal watcher of the skirts, the political skirts and legal skirts of the President of the United States. That is not the job of the Attorney General of the United States, in my humble opinion. Have you spoken to Robert Mueller in the past, I don't know, six months, a year? Are you kidding me? Listen, if Bob Mueller is the straightest guy I've ever met, Bob Cordy is the second straightest, maybe Mark Wolf and I are tied for the third straightest. <laughs> so, no, I wouldn't talk to Bob <laughs> since the day he was appointed. All right. Um, big issue, and this is an a audience question. Um, Everyone's, you know, sort of, well, I like the way they put it. Um, should it's about health care. Should employers provide health care or should the government do it? Well, no, the government shouldn't do it. We don't, we don't need a single payer system. The, uh, uh, the Democrats' proposal would essentially take all the private money out of the system, abolishing private insurance, and that would be a disaster. My, my one major, it's more than a cavill, my one re major reservation about uh, the Affordable Care Act, also called Obamacare, uh, is that there's too much government in it, and I'd like to see more individual decision-making. People should have health savings accounts. They could decide whether they want uh, a Cadillac or a Chevrolet, and the Affordable Care Act does mandate 
uh, that there will be a government-supported Cadillac for everybody, and you have to have the Cadillac. So we get a lot of uh, money paid for operations that may or may not be necessary in the eye of the person receiving that care. So there's enormous increase in costs from that. Now, the act is not all bad. It did bring 20 million more people into the system. You need to do that in order to spread uh, more broadly uh, the number of people over whom you socialize the cost of, uh, of uh, medicine. Uh, and uh, by socialize, I just mean spreading it among a lot of people. Uh, but, and I wouldn't waste my time trying to either repeal or uh, not repeal the Affordable Care Act because Congress has divided almost 50-50 on that. I would do uh, <clears throat> small reforms like uh, uh, having health savings accounts for individuals, letting people buy insurance, uh, health insurance across state lines, let, let people buy pharmaceuticals uh, in uh, Canada or other places to, to cut costs. Uh, but that would be a blue ribbon commission on day one. Uh, cost of higher education, cost of health care, in particular, uh, particularly pharmaceuticals. Th those are national problems, and I think they would uh, succumb to a, a first-rate national commission's analysis. So you basically see employers continuing to be the main source of providing health insurance? Not the government, please. Okay. <laughs> no. That'd be nine-month waits for an operation. Okay. Um, foreign policy. What are your, this is a question in the audience, what are your foreign policy credentials and what do you view as the appropriate role of the U.S. Uh, to play in the world? I think the U.S. should remain engaged with the world. Mr. Trump uh, wants to take us out of the world. Uh, his, his preference can only be described as isolationist. Uh, you know, I grew up in a world where we were engaged and uh, the world was prosperous and safe. As a result, the United States has been <clears throat> the enforcer of uh, first resort and last resort since World War II in keeping uh, the sea lanes and the air lanes open for commerce, which contribute directly to the prosperity of many, many countries in the world, including uh, the United States. Uh, so I think that's a legit role. Uh, I'm, I'm not for sending 21, 22, 23-year-old boots on the ground to other countries uh, for regime change simply because I see something I don't like in that other country. And I'm afraid that has happened uh, in the past. And I'm not parking that particular hearse at Mr. Trump's door. Uh, I think Mr. Trump has been entirely too fast and loose with uh, nuclear, uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, I'm a, speaking of credentials, I'm a member of... Uh, a group of former heads of state, worldwide heads of state, called the Interaction Council. Everyone's a head of state except for me. I was only head of one state, but these guys, Jean Chrétien, Canada, and Franz Vernetsky in Austria, and uh, uh, Bertie Ahern in Ireland, they all knew me from my travels when I was governor and since. When I was governor, I led 16 trade missions to Asia and Africa and Latin America and uh, South America. <clears throat> and since then, a lot of my uh, law and consulting practice uh, has been uh, with natural resources companies all over the world, mainly Asia and Africa. But, uh, and, and uh, Leslie and I, I should have introduced my wife Leslie earlier. Hi, baby. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so we go to these meetings of the uh, s former heads of state every year in, in Azerbaijan, Bahrain, uh, Peking recently, where I got to have a one-on-one -on -one with Wang Qishan, who's the number two or three guy in China. <clears throat> so we've been rubbing elbows with heads of state and former heads of state for a long time. And, and I, when I say I could start Monday in the Oval Office, I'm including uh, the international arena. Uh, I'm an active member of the Council on Foreign Relations. It may not be everybody's dish of tea, but it certainly exposes you to uh, a lot of foreign policy. Uh, issues. And uh, so at these meetings, uh, the, the heads of state uh, talk about the greatest threats facing their countries. Every year, number one is nuclear nonproliferation. Number two is religious sectarianism, which is uh, a euphemism for Sunni versus Shia. Number three is water, and number four is food. That's what the heads of government worry about when they go to sleep at night. And, and I've internalized all this in my travels. 
So those are my credentials, and that's what I think. So, you know, I mean, his, the, Trump's critics will say his foreign policy is a bunch of bluster and threats and bullying, but there are a lot of Republicans who think that he's been tough and effective. Well, his first recourse is tariffs and thumping on uh, the table and uh, bullying, uh, which is his style in business uh, as well. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I do think that China, I had high hopes for Xi Jinping when he came in. Uh, he had family ties to the, the uh, province of Guangdong, which is the southern province. And uh, I spent a lot of time there when I was uh, in office. It was the first uh, part of China to liberalize, meaning turn in a market direction. And so I thought he was a market-oriented guy. And his, uh, his rival for the, uh, the top spot, uh, Bo Xilai, was a terrible... Uh, Maoist cult of personality guy. Uh, so I was, he's the guy whose wife killed the Englishman and got all kinds of trouble. Lots of trouble. Uh, and um, so, so I was pleased when Xi Jinping got in, but, but he's taken a turn. And when he came in, he made uh, market type noises about we're going to bring the SOEs, the state owned enterprises, to heal so they can't be so inefficient. And that's been reversed. They're going back to the SOEs and having huge government subsidies, which gives those companies uh, an unfair advantage in trade uh, and investment around the world. I can tell you, I spent a reasonable amount of time in Africa, the Chinese are beating our brains in, in Africa, because uh, China National Railway Company or another state-owned enterprise will come along and say, well, you need this, that, and the other infrastructure. Uh, we'd be happy to build that for you assuming that you uh, hire us to do it and uh, and we won't even charge you anything. All we want is a 15-year supply contract for all your cobalt and your uh, platinum and palladium. It's a good deal for the Chinese and they're beating our brains in. And that's, that's an unfair advantage. And on intellectual property, uh, you know, it's, uh, their, their position is completely insupportable. They, they passed a law saying that anyone who interferes with the exploitation of uh, intellectual property, who has a joint venture with anyone in China, is guilty of a criminal offense. Well, that means that if you have any IP and you do business in China, they have a right to steal your IP or you're going to jail. So I think Trump is right to be tough with the Chinese. What, what I would not go along with is his, his first, last, and seemingly almost only recourse is tariffs and sanction. It's all negativity, which is how he behaves in the business world as well. To negotiate with Donald Trump is to experience true negativity. And he's most negative toward the little people. When his, when his casinos went bankrupt in Atlantic City, he got with the banks and said, you guys have to pay me hundreds of millions of dollars of more money, even though my casinos went bankrupt, because if you don't, I will walk and you will lose all your collateral. And we can create a pot of money to fund this by making sure that all the little people, the vendors, get stiffed and don't collect more than five or 10 cents on the dollar. I'm not making this up. And that'll create a pot of money so you can give me a lot of money and you, the big banks, will have more money as well. I'll tell you, I'm starting to lose it about big banks. <laughs> it's, uh, it's an increasingly not pretty story. Well, and that's a whole other issue there, but I would like to get to education because many Democrats are calling for free public college, debt-free education, which I'm guessing is gonna be pretty popular with voters out there, especially in the 20, 30, even into 48 range with people with very large college debt. How do you feel about these proposals and what's your solution if not? Well, I, I think free, uh, free college education for everybody is probably a bridge too far. That's the Sanders proposal. But uh, I have made a major policy proposal that the workers who get, uh, U.S. workers who get displaced over the next 10 years as a result of robotics and drones and machine learning and self-driving vehicles and artificial intelligence, and there'll be a lot of them. Some people say 15% of the U.S. workforce, some people say 25%. There will be replacement jobs that require more technical skills than these people now have, uh, but they require two more years of learning, which is essentially the equivalent of community college level. <coughs> and I think that should be free 
to the displaced workers. It would not be very expensive. I've priced it out for a couple of states. It would be a fraction of 1% of the state budget. That's without any federal help at all. Uh, and it would be uh, addressing a national need. And if you turn the clock back, and I w even I was not alive for this, but when the GIs came home from World War II, there was the GI Bill. They could go to college anywhere they wanted. It was essentially a voucher system, highly successful. They got reintegrated into society. They were, you know, they were the greatest generation. The, the older Bush's book, the greatest, or Tom Brokaw's book about the older Bush and his generation. They were the greatest generation. Well, maybe we can make this generation's displaced workers the, the greatest generation. And those are Trump voters. Those are displaced, uh, displaced workers. No one in Washington is doing a thing for them. But so the idea of, <coughs> as I said earlier, focusing on the cost of higher education and even free higher education to the extent you can do it, that's not a silly idea. That's not a frivolous idea. It's not just a socialist idea. We got to get there one way or the other. One of my hobby horses is online learning, so-called distance education. And it can be completely free. Harvard and MIT have made all their courses online. They're completely accessible, just a matter of organization. And recent research has shown that online education is just as sticky as sticks to the head as education in the little red schoolhouse where Johnny and Janie were brought uh, through social education growing up. So if you think hard, you can get at the education cost and the education effectiveness. Okay, I hope it's okay if I read names because this is from Mitch Blaustein from Canton and he says he lives a street away from you. Um, he says, I really think if you changed to a D, a Democrat, you would do much better. Do you agree? It's been suggested to me that I've already had enough party switches. <laughs> I've never been, I've never been uh, somehow uh, uh, temp tempted to, uh, uh, to change to a, a D. And I think it's because, you know, enough of the, <clears throat> the Republican Party that I grew up in, which is fiscal conservatism, emphasis on the environment, uh, engagement in international affairs, recognizing the United States has a responsibility to the world, uh, that was all the people uh, that, that I grew up with, and it was, uh, it was accepted in the Republican Party. I worked in the Senate uh, for Senator Javits of New York at a time when if somebody was giving a big speech in the Senate chamber right here, the galleries, those galleries right up there, they would all be filled with people who wanted to hear the speech to see whether they would be persuaded by the speech. Now, if anyone gives a speech in the Senate chamber in Washington, maybe not this one, but in Washington, it's just one person, it's four o'clock in the morning, the chamber is dark, the rules of C-SPAN set by Congress require that the camera never leave the person's face. The person's face is lit. So you think it's you know being given in the daylight to try to persuade people. It's a complete fraud. It's just political advertising. So it's a different world, and not just in the Republican Party. I think it started uh, in the 94 election. Things, things really started to go south, and it's been hyper-partisan uh, ever, ever since then. So uh, what I'm You're saying... You're not becoming a Democrat. No, no. What I'm so. saying in a nice way is there's, there's spots on, on the Democratic Party, too. <laughs> okay. So Marcy from Watertown, please say a word about infrastructure. I know you're working with Mike Dukakis on getting the North-South rail link built. And obviously that's a huge issue in Congress right now. Well, Michael and I, uh, and I call him Michael, we're former, former law partners years and years ago, we both think that uh, the North-South Rail Link is an issue that should succumb to analysis because uh, it relates to labor motil uh, mobility between north of town and south of town, which is, relates to our regional economic competitiveness. So that's an issue where I think you can prove that this project should be built some people say it costs $12 billion. Some people say it costs $2 billion. Okay, well, let's find out. And it may survive cost-benefit analysis. But I've always thought that having the trains turn around when they get to South Station, and you have to have 60 acres of layover space uh, south of, south of uh, Boston, which could be devoted to other uses. So, uh, and I think infrastructure is uh, a wonderful expenditure of public funds. It does have to survive cost-benefit analysis. I'm quite interested 
uh, in, in having the private sector participate uh, in that. And the other national organization I was head of, besides U.S. term limits, was the uh, United States Privatization Council. And I do think a lot of the big, matter of fact, I know, a lot of the big engineering and construction firms, uh, if a proper contract uh, could be devised, and I could do it, uh, would be very happy to shoulder the initial burden uh, through the genius of the U.S. financial system, uh, the initial cost of some of these projects. So that would be one thing I would bring to the table that you don't hear too much about these days. All you hear is we need X trillion dollars for infrastructure for projects that are shovel-ready out there. They aren't always shovel-ready, and they don't always pass cost-benefit analysis, and they get awarded on the basis of politics. But, you know, I, I'm just briefly, obviously, it seems like infrastructure is the one thing down on Capitol Hill that people could actually come together on, and there seems like there's They sure going could. On down there, they so. sure could, because every one of those projects is in somebody's district, and they'll get together, you know, log rolling and earmarks are supposed to be a thing of the past. But uh, if you say to Congress, well, I've got $10 trillion here to spend on infrastructure, do you think you folks could get together and decide how to spend it? Yeah, they could get together in a big hurry and decide how to spend it. And it doesn't mean it would be wisely spent. Okay, fair enough. David from Natick, and I love this question because I, have, I was wondering this myself. Will you be able to have an opportunity to debate the president? How is that going to work? Does he, ha he has to agree to that in order for Well, he has said, I'm not debating Bill Weld or anybody else. It's part of his new offensive to say that he lives in a hermetically sealed bubble and <laughs> no one's allowed to talk to him and he doesn't have to talk to anybody else. Now, whether that sticks depends on political developments uh, over the next six, eight, ten months, and ultimately it's 18 months uh, until the election, uh, historically, the Presidential com uh, Commission on Debates has said, okay, we're going to host these debates, and anybody who's over 15% uh, gets to be in the debates. And Gary Johnson and I got to 13% shortly before that decision was made, so we didn't get in the debates, but we almost did. Now, you know, in a two-man race, uh, frankly, as the discussion wears on and I get to make my arguments and get more around the country, I'm highly likely to be over 15 percent. So maybe the Presidential Commission on Debates, which was my great foe last time, will wind up being my friend. And then it might be difficult for the president to say no, because then you're going to have me with an audience of 60 million people and an empty chair next to me. But I, I don't know how it's going to play out, but that's certainly a delicious scenario. Yeah, I was going to do you dream about getting to stand up there with him and debate him? Because the next question is what well, would No, you even better would be if he filled that chair. <laughs> well, and would you have a particular strategy? I mean, there's, you know, there's two ways of going about it. You take him head on and you go tit for tat on every uh, insult or you, you know, you ignore that. What, what would your strategy in that regard be? Well, people sometimes say, if he just insults you over the top, are you going to sit there and take it? And the answer is absolutely not. I, I would not play by the Marquis of Queensbury's rules if he's not. But, you know, you see the eight debates that I had with John Kerry when I ran against him and lost, but ran against him in 1996. Uh, it was pretty hot and heavy and uh, no quarter given or asked. But it was, uh, you know, a, a fair fight, uh, as, as I always said, and he said. Uh, and I think we gave the issues a pretty good vetting, and we had very different perspectives. Uh, John, at that point, I thought, was one of the three or four most liberal uh, members of the United States Senate. And I was pretty conservative on crime, welfare, and taxes. So uh, we weren't even in the same you know, area. So we could have been much more mean than we were, but we weren't mean at all. It was carried out on a, a vigorous but pretty high plane. So I, I could do that. Somehow, I don't think <laughs> that the president's <laughs> approach would lend itself to that. No, 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 no. Margaret from Concord, what are your thoughts on gun control and how to stop school shootings? I mean, this is a voting issue for a lot of people. Where does it go on the... So uh, I'm, I think we have to focus on keeping guns out of the hands of people who might have mental illness problem like uh, Sandy Hook, which I think is the worst of all. I can't get that out of are my head. Are you ever hand. an NRA member? Uh, or are you an NRA No, no, I'm not. But, but I'm a lifelong hunter, as, as, as you That's know. That's why I asked. Um, okay. so, so I think s safety is the issue. And uh, so I'm for the red flag, the badges, signs of mental uh, 
mental instability of any kind. Uh, I, I don't know why someone shouldn't have to pass a gun safety test to, to buy a gun. We did when I bought a gun. Uh, you had to not only prove that you knew the rules of the road, you had to give the little certificate saying you'd passed a gun safety test and you'd seen all the photographs of people who didn't break their shotgun before trying to cross a fence and only part of their head was still there. And it's very persuasive stuff. Um, and there are a variety of other measures. I know Mike Bloomberg has a, a bunch of proposals to, uh, to make sure that uh, guns don't fall in the wrong hands. So that's on the, if you will, liberal side of that issue. On the, if you will, conservative side of that issue, uh, gun ownership, not so, not so clear about that. There are 300 million rifles out there in private hands. And if the government said, okay, you all have to come and register uh, your firearm at the police station and bring it in once a year just to show it to us to make sure you haven't done it, anything to it. If you read history books, on the third year, they're gonna say, oh, so sorry, you're not leaving, that, that gun belongs to us now. And the history is horrifying. Uh, and this is not generally known in the United States, but in countries that have made it uh, virtually impossible to own a firearm, the government often winds up slaughtering a lot of the citizens. Hitler made it uh, virtually impossible for Jews to own firearms. So when the, when the uh, Gestapo came knocking at their door, there was nothing they could do. Uh, 12 million people killed, uh, the majority of them Jews. Stalin's Russia, impossible to own a firearm, 20 million killed. And they just got sent to the gulags and they couldn't resist. Idi Amin in Uganda, probably the worst ruler of the 20th century, slaughtered all of his political opponents when firearms were made illegal. So I, I kind of, uh, I kind of buy the idea that- But there that is a difference between making them illegal and just and keeping uh, high-powered machine guns off the street. Oh, no, no, no. The, the, you can't have machine guns on the street. And, and, you know, when I was a prosecutor, I prosecuted a lot of cases where people would take an AR-15, which is a standard military rifle, pull a pin out of the top, and then you've got a fully automatic weapon just by pulling a pin out. So we got, you know, we got 10, 15-year sentences on these guys. But uh, so in terms of prohibiting uh, manufacture of certain types of guns, uh, I wouldn't prohibit the manufacture of a rifle just because you could put it on a tripod, which makes it look horribly sinister. But I certainly would uh, prohibit the manufacture of a regular rifle that you could turn into an automatic weapon simply by removing a pin, because the law is you cannot own a fully automatic weapon, meaning that one, unless you're a federally licensed firearms dealer. People don't know that. They think that you can just go buy a machine gun. It can't be done. So uh, that, that's sort of where I would come out. And, uh, uh, but I do think it's important to, to keep uh, the rifles that are in the hands of uh, law-abiding citizens uh, in private hands and not have them surrendered to the government. Uh, what are your thoughts about choosing a running mate? I know a lot of candidates in the Democratic side, the men, are being asked if they would commit to choosing a woman. Um, where are you with all? I, I think it would just be so presumptuous of me to talk or even think about a running mate that I, I haven't given any thought whatsoever. Okay. Uh, Marie Louise Jackson Miller of Quincy wants to know if you are uh, planning to reduce military spending, and if so, what your strategy would be. Well, I, I might. Uh, I remember 1984 when Gary Hart ran as a so-called Atari Democrat, and he had a lot of plans for uh, making, uh, making our weapon systems uh, smarter and less expensive, uh, and I wouldn't be willing as I sit here to take an oath saying that there's not room to do that sort of thing uh, again. In other words, I'm, I'm not wed to last year's military budget plus 5%, put it that way, or 10%. Okay. Um, so I'm trying, I want to make sure I get in. There's so many good questions here. Um, are you waiting for Donald Trump to come up, for an, come up with a nickname for you? One of the questions. <laughs> Well, we've thought of a few for him, I can tell you that. <laughs> yeah, would you do that? Would you get into calling him nicknames if he starts throwing one out at you? Or Are you kidding? I'm trigger happy on this. I'm just waiting for the first. Oh, give us, give us like a, 
Bring, us bring a, on the first insult. Give us a little hint. Uh, Bill de Blasio says it's con Don, but I don't know. What do you, have you had any We thoughts? think that's good, but not great. We think we can do better. <laughs> okay, so how would you, uh, this is another audience question. How will you bring Congress together to cross the aisle for the unity, the good of the country? Well, you've got to lead by example, and as you know, in this, uh, in this state, I inaugurated the system of meeting with the Senate President and the Speaker of the House and the Lieutenant Governor, and we were Republicans and they were Democrats, every week, every Monday. And we talked and joked, and occasionally we talked substance, but usually it was social. And my thinking was, uh, it's hard to stab somebody in the back or tell the press that they're a jerk if you know you're going to be having this essentially friendly and social meeting within the next seven days. And it works so well that they're still doing it. And that's a little thing. It, it's kind of like, uh, you know, the meetings when Sam Rayburn was Speaker of the House in Washington. They would meet for bourbon and branch water at the Board of Education, which met in this tiny room underneath a, a um, wonderful marble staircase. Uh, but a lot got done there. And I sure did a lot with that leadership. Uh, we didn't have bourbon and branch. We had uh, tea and cookies. Uh, but a lot got done. And, if I, and it's how you do it. You know, when I proposed this, I said, let's do the first one in the Speaker's office, uh, the second one in the Senate President's office, and then we can do the third one in my office and just rotate. So they didn't feel they were being summoned. You know, little things mean a lot. And as Tom Birmingham, who is a later president of the Senate, who I still am working with uh, via Pioneer Institute on education issues. We publish papers uh, together. As he said, goodwill begets goodwill. And ain't that the truth? And its opposite is also true. All right, well, and that's a, th those meetings are a tradition that continues at the State House. And reporters love them because you can catch the speaker walking down the hall at 2 o'clock on a Monday afternoon. Thank you for that. Go Governor, you've been terrific. Thank you so much for letting us fire away at you here. And um, audience's questions were fantastic. And I'd like to turn it over now to Dr. Grant for just a closing statement. Thank you all for coming this evening. And, and Governor Weld, I want to thank you for leading us in this very informative conversation and helping us to launch this presidential series. Thank you so much for being with us. How about a round of applause for Governor Weld? Thank you. <laughs> Allison, thank you for guiding the conversation so well and fielding questions and moving the discussion along. We truly appreciate you being with us. It's always wonderful to have you at the Institute. Thank you to Allison King for being with us. The governor has generously offered to remain for a few mo moments after the program for photos if anyone would like one. Um, and I also want to just invite all of you to return to this series. We will be inviting, joined on June 13th by Congressman Seth Moulton, who will be next up in our presidential series. So please feel free to come back, register, bring your colleagues with you. Each day the Institute welcomes people into this beautiful replica of the United States Senate where we learn how to make public policy and have discussions. And so maybe as we work through these conversations there will be other who come through this place over time who one day will consider running for President of the United States. Thank you all for coming. Governor, thank you. Allison, thank you. Good evening. <laughs>